Uh, Val Archer, um, April 13, 1929. Uh, first the Army, uh, Army Air Corps and then the Air Force. I uh, joined the uh, Tuskegee Airmen at Lockbourne uh, near Columbus, Ohio. And um, then from there to uh, the integration of the uh, armed forces, I went to the Air Force, and that was at Washington, D.C., Bowling and Andrews Air Bases. And from there to Korea, and from there to Japan, and from there to Guam, and from there to the Marshalls, Marshall Islands, and back to the States, uh, and then to finally to Europe. And I spent the last six years overseas uh, in Europe. It, in those days, uh, during World War II, uh, there was heavy duty propaganda, and as well as, as good information uh, reporting about the war and the conditions and what it meant and so on. So uh, at my age, and as with most of the young people in those days, we felt uh, uh, an obligation, a commitment, and patriotism, and uh, you know we were really excited about those kinds of opportunities. Uh, I watched all of the newsreels at every opportunity. Uh, my grandfather was an av avid uh, fan of a guy named Gabriel Heater at that time. Uh, who was the uh, national news commentator. I don't know what, what um, uh, agency he was with, but um, we re, uh, regurgitated the war on a daily basis, and my grandfather and I. Despite the segregation and all of the really ugly uh, racial stuff that existed in the country at that time, uh, the war was, a, 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 I think in my head, and, and I'm sure a lot of other young, especially black, uh, black men, uh, that was a different, a different situation. That was, uh, uh, that was our country uh, as well as anybody else's, and uh, no matter what went on in it, of course we didn't like that, but um, the commitment, the obligation was still there. And at a very young, uh, obviously impressionable age, um, it, it just seemed, you know, it was a, sort of the right thing to do. It all happened very quickly because um, uh, a friend of mine, uh, we had, uh, on that particular day, we had gone past this recruiting office today, and he sort of dared me to, okay, you're going to go in and do this again. But we had tried to enlist in the, uh, in the Navy and the Marine Corps. <laughs> we had tried to get, we wanted to get in the war. It, uh, that's what what 15-year-olds uh, at that time. Had. I think we may have been a little bit more gung-ho than the guys who were 18 and, and 20. Initial um, basic training at, um, I went, had my basic at uh, Shepherd, um, Wichita Falls, Texas. Uh, from there I went to uh, Spokane uh, for um, a combat engineer, aviation engineering program. And um, I went, went to a demolition school to blow up things, bridges and stuff. Okay. Um, and uh, the day I uh, finished that, that class, um, there was a sort of a, uh, I think an alert out or something that, um, as I understood it at the time, um, that we were to report to this all-black organization. Uh, and that was my experience in getting um, f initially into the service and then initially into the uh, Tuskegee Airmen. We were not known as Tuskegee Airmen, of course, at that time, but rather that uh, black aviation organization. Well, my, my brief experience uh, in the service uh, at that time, although it seemed like I was a, a, a veteran by that time, I'd gone through basic training and, and demolition school and, and so on, uh, struck me immediately uh, that when I reported into this base that these guys, starting with the, uh, the MPs on the gate, were really sharp people. They were dressed sharp. They were, uh, their presentation was good. Uh, and then I saw the first, uh, first black officer 
And so, and I, did, I had no idea at that time that all the officers were black and all the, everybody else was as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I was oppressed and uh, from a kid who uh, had my, uh, my uh, most recent experiences as a civilian was also as a gang member and um, um, the kind of things that we did were different from what I expected uh, uh, in the service. Uh, until that time, uh, I doubt if I actually knew two professional, professional people mm -hmm. at all. Um, um, and when I met this group, uh, I immediately uh, uh, was in, in the presence of, of guys who were serious about uh, what they were doing. And it didn't matter so much that they were in uniform, but these guys were whatever they were doing. And this is what they impressed on me, that no matter what you're doing in this organization, uh, you're going to do it professionally. Mm -hmm. And I got that from, uh, from the old sergeants as well as the uh, young officers. So um, they took care of business with the young people coming in at that time. I started off as an instrument uh, specialist. And I don't know how that connected with blowing up things, but. Uh, that, that was my first assignment, and then uh, from there I was assigned to a crew on a P-47, and uh, from there to um, a tech school at Chinook uh, Air Base, and from Chinook back to Lockbourne, and uh, I took advantage of every opportunity to go to uh, technical, technical training. Maintained uh, all of the flight instruments and the um, Flight simulator at that time, which was like a box with uh, <laughs> some instruments in it okay. <laughs> <laughs> and some buttons. Uh, very mechanical, very um, ancient stuff. Nothing like the flight simulators today, I see. of course. But um, that uh, I would, um, in addition to um, doing the instruments, I also uh, assisted all the other specialists on it which gave me an opportunity to taxi the planes around uh, the runway. Oh, okay. And I had an excuse to do that because as an instrument specialist, I had to swing the compasses. Okay. So I could, <laughs> had a lot of fun with that. At Lockbourne, we had mostly, we had P-47s, of course, uh, and then uh, B-25s and uh, T-6s, the uh, Texas trainers we had. Mm -hmm. And I think there were a few, uh, a few steermans that, uh, from time to time that were on the base. Okay. And we had uh, um, occasionally some Goonie Birds, the C-47s that came in. So. Militarily, from um, the mission point of view, uh, I think uh, we, were, uh, um, we were sort of involved in, in still in, in preparing for um, for war, it was a kind of a psychological thing, I think, because even though uh, after uh, after uh, the war was over with Japan, uh, we were still training, and with the uh, B-25s, of course, that we got that very late in it, and uh, it was still in that some kind of attitude that uh, okay, this one is over for now, but. And it may have been that there was some anticipation about uh, an additional war or follow-up something, which unfortunately did occur uh, with, um, with the Korean conflict. Mm -hmm. But um, it was a, a, a kind of a training uh, business, and it was still continued to be serious. Uh, in my case, as with a lot of uh, other younger guys, uh, the senior guys were still very professional and very, I don't want to call them gung-ho, but they were, um, again, they were just on top of their game. Mm -hmm. And they made certain that we were as well. So, um, um, so we sort of continued in, in, in that vein until the, uh, the integration, and we sort of had some advance notice about that. Uh, the integration was not going to be uh, uh, that um, the white personnel were going to come to our base and integrate, uh, integrate our base. Mm -hmm. The idea was that we were going to all the other bases around the world 
And what that meant was that we were going in onesies and twosies and so on. And uh, although uh, technically and legally and so on, um, segregation was supposed to be over, uh, they were waiting for us. And they ate our lunch when we got there. So, uh, and that went on for, uh, for probably the next 10 years. It was, uh, uh, we never saw racism like that uh, before because um, when we were all together on one base, uh, it sort of didn't exist on, on, on the base and during uh, duty hours. But um, going to another inst installation um, where it was full time um, being involved with uh, uh, other people and, and other duties and other responsibilities and so on, we had to be integrated into that, into that machinery. And uh, it was very difficult because there were some people who had an attitude that we're going to teach you a lesson uh, and so on. And uh, um, the emotional aspects of that was, it, in one sense, it was a challenge. And in another sense is, um, in my case, for example, and some of the other guys I knew, we came out of gangs. And that was just not going to happen. You know, it was just going to be a... a you know, we just have to duke it out. Mm -hmm. And that did happen uh, in a lot of cases. Uh, the outcome of that was, of course, uh, uh, we spent a lot of time um, uh, on details and, um, and extra duty stuff and no promotions. And uh, it was ugly. You know, we, when uh, Executive Order uh, 9981 was signed by President Truman, of course, that, that information went out, and it went not only to, uh, to us, but it went to everybody in, the, in uniform. Mm -hmm. And um, at, at that time, there was so much going on. Uh, there was a transition from the Army to the, uh, the Air Force, and the change in uniforms, the change in, in all um, outward uh, appearances. Uh, and then gradually, um, uh, we didn't sort of all leave in, at one, on one day uh, to different bases, but it was pretty, pretty uh, rapid deployment. Uh, I was just sort of challenged a, a lot by some guys who were, uh, who were bigger, and they were sort of laying down the, the rules, like, you know, just like on the block. Uh, and that. So that was not, I was not intimidated by that. And um, as a result of that, uh, sometimes I had to fight these guys, and uh, they had to fight me. Uh, and uh, there was uh, a number of occasions when that was uh, it was not unusual. I think the uh, the toughest day that that I can remember personally was uh, was on Guam, uh, and that was in Guam. That was about 1956 or 57, I think. Uh, where um, uh, where I was confronted by this uh, by this first sergeant and uh, and his one of his guys who said that uh, they were going to teach me a lesson and so on and there really wasn't anything I can do about it uh, and and so on and uh, um, It was, it was more, mostly, you know, uh, an, a, a kind of a humiliating experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, I knew that, uh, and they knew that I knew that if, if I attempted to, uh, to be physical to resolve it that way, uh, you know, there were MPs and so on, and I'd just do... What, what they were telling me is that uh, they were trying to set me up so that I would, uh, I would do some time in... in uh, I didn't call it the joint in the guardhouse at that time. It was the same thing. And that was the, that was the worst experience that, that, that I had uh, because I felt that um, um, the, um, the choices that I had were so, so restricted and that, uh, that they could afford to be that bold uh, in my face and... Uh, uh, and, and intimidate me uh, in that fashion. That was hard. It was really hard.
the war was one thing, and uh, the commitment to that, the responsibility for that, was different from the responsibility for dealing with people on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. Serving in that capacity under those conditions, uh, not completely unique because, again, the, the guys in the uh, uh, Buffalo Soldiers, the 369th, and the, the Navy guys, what they went through and so on was very similar. But uh, it was an experience that I think uh, um, will not be repeated again. I think, w uh, and uh, that's because uh, uh, we were part of that experiment that was obviously designed to fail, and the implications would be that uh, there would that would be the end of it. Um, but we we managed to survive that. And, and do it very well. I think I'm proud of our performance, and I'm proud of uh, the perform our performance during the next uh, 10 to 20 years after that, where the armed forces now are probably the most integrated and successful uh, community and culture uh, in, in the history of this country. That was you know, one of my uh, the highlights of my uh, visit to the Capitol for that that ceremony uh, when I was, um, uh, after the presentation by the, the president and that, and we started to, go, to leave the auditorium, um, Senator Durbin's, uh, one of his assistants, uh, came and was talking, I was, at the time, I was talking to the president of the Chicago chapter, and, uh, and she asked us to come, to come with her. And uh, she asked if I was from if I was from Chicago, and I, I said yes, of course I was. So that was all the the conversation. So uh, um, Bev Dungeon is the president of Chicago chapter. So uh, Bev and I followed her uh, uh, to Senator Durbin's office, where he was having a little reception for some of the guys. And. Uh, um, while we were there, he said, uh, I know you have to go to somewhere else, but if you stick around for a few minutes, I want you to meet uh, my fellow senator from Illinois, which, who of course was Obama. And uh, so I got a chance to spend an hour or so with them. It was really uh, a rewarding experience. Since the end of, end of uh, World War II, uh, many of us have continued to, to meet with young people and especially in schools and with other uh, youth organizations and programs, and uh, share with them uh, something of our experience and how, to, how important it is for them to develop uh, character and, and uh, responsibility and so on. And I think we've done, we've done an outstanding job with that over, over the years. And uh, the evidence of that is that, uh, in, in my own case, uh, I've met uh, young men who are now 06 uh, full colonels that I had spoken to when they were in, in, uh, in high school. So uh, as far as the military is concerned, of course, others uh, have, uh, have gone on and become successful uh, in other careers in business and education and so on. Um, uh, but um, what we have not been able to do successfully, I think, is to organize our program in the same way that organizations like the, the Boy Scouts of America and, and uh, uh, the YMCA and those kinds of, kinds of programs. Uh, although I think we've carried the water for, for young people for a long time, um, we have not known how to... Um, how to promote that into a program that was funded and that had uh, s uh, some substance and material and support and financial support, uh, especially. I think we're gradually uh, developing uh, our resources to do that. Um, my life story, I think, is to um, is as early as possible uh, to uh, develop a goal and have a plan and try to uh, associate with people uh, who are intelligent and uh, strong and, and are committed to something. Uh, it's a good idea not to drift, not to, to uh, follow the, the crowd and, and be one of the boys. Um, 
most young people, I think, have some ability to, uh, given the opportunity, to develop a very special, uh, special, special life. I'll say, but it doesn't happen randomly. I think it doesn't happen without a plan. So I encourage them to uh, get a plan that in, that includes education, that includes uh, something about self-respect, uh, something about integrity. Uh, something about responsibility uh, to themselves and to their family and their country and so on. Uh, that's, that's where my, my commitment is and continues to be right now. I'm, I'm preparing right now to start working with uh, uh, some kids in the youth detention center. Mm -hmm. That's my next, uh, my next project. Liberty to me means uh, being uh, freedom from uh, um, obviously from oppression of, of any kind, but uh, I think um, mostly the freedom from being confined. Mm. And uh, I think um, being a black man, uh, that is uh, always a possibility, even today. Uh, there is always this sort of, um, I won't say it's a threat, but um, um, to be at liberty to, is to be free from, from that. In my, my career in the military uh, is all part of uh, uh, my civilian career as well because after retiring, I went to school nights for about 20 years to get my uh, one course at a time to get through my undergraduate uh, program and then finally I got to, when I got um, retired, I was offered a fellowship to do my graduate program. And, and then uh, from there, I con continued on. Um, and I um, spent about 10 years with the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. Uh, I'm very proud of that e experience as well. And, and also um, some work that I did with, uh, with uh, broadcasting uh, to um, challenge the, uh, the owners of broadcasting uh, networks uh, to be more responsive to the needs of uh, race and age and all the other isms that, uh, that they were uh, not very upfront with. And that was about for another 10 years in involving that. <laughs> so uh, it, it's been a, a kind of a continuing challenge. I uh, also um, uh, was able to, um, um, I was assigned to a uh, presidential task force with the Carter administration, which uh, I'm very proud of that experience. And I uh, was uh, an associate director at the Executive Seminar Center at Kings Point, and uh, that was a good, a good experience. And as a consultant and uh, a, uh, an analyst with the uh, uh, Department of Army and Headquarters Forces Command, uh, that was another good experience. So I had some good, some good experiences as well as some, some tough ones. Mm -hmm. And I want to share that for, for young people who, uh, who want to know if, uh, is it possible to ever break away from the, the stuff and, uh, uh, that is possible. And the opportunities for uh, technology today are just incredible, just unheard of. And I think um, being proud of what we did to, uh, to uh, enhance those opportunities for young people today, uh, I think we've done good. Mm -hmm. And I think they would do good if they take advantage of those opportunities. Mm -hmm.